Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Lubna from Anatomy Department, PJMI, and today we're going to learn about the human ear. By definition, the um, human ear is the organ used to detect sound, and oris is the word which is used instead of ear. It's, it's a synonym, let's say. And the related Latin words of audio, derivative is oral. Anything that is related to the ear, we say it's oral, right? So the ear is divided into three parts, the outer ear, uh, the middle ear, and the inner ear. In this class, we're going to learn about the outer ear. The outer ear or the external ear. We're going to learn about the parts that this is composed of. And the external ear is composed of the pinna or the auricle that is visible externally. The external acoustic meatus, which is the auditory canal. Uh, it is also called the external auditory meatus. And the tympanic membrane, which makes its medial most boundary. Now, first of all, we're going to learn about the auricle or the pinna. The pinna and the external auditory canal makes up the outer ear or the external ear. The pinna is the cartilage of the ear which acts as a funnel to capture the sound. If we cup our hands uh, to our ears, we notice that the sound of our voice becomes louder. Or similarly, if we roll up a piece of paper like a funnel and put it to our ear, it functions like the pinna. So the transmission of sound vibrations through the outer ear occurs chiefly through the air. In this diagram, we can see the pinna, which is cartilaginous, highly variable in appearance, and external auditory canal or the external auditory meatus, which is about 2.5 centimeters tube. Now here we can see the pinna or the auricle and its landmarks. Now let's see if I tell you about the external features of this. I'll, I'll just tell you starting from this part which is called the helix, right? And uh, for helix there is a crust. So this, this portion is the crust of helix. Crust is the root or the most important point or the most prominent point. Similarly, uh, uh, this portion is anti-helix and these two are the crust or the uh, crura. The singular is crust and the plural is uh, crura. These are the crura of anti-helix. Okay? Here we said was helix and this is anti-helix. Okay? Okay, now, the next feature that we're going to talk about is um, fossa triangularis, which lies in between the crust of um, anti-helix, right? The upper and lower crust of anti-helix. And here, here is the scaphoid fossa. So there are two fossae here. One of them is the fossa triangularis and the other is the scaphoid fossa. Okay? The deepest depression that we see here is the conca of the air. And this, in between the helix and the anti-helix, is the simba conchi. This is called the simba conchi. All right. Now, this part, which is overlapping in front of the conca, is tragus. Right. And this is antitragus. This portion that you see here is intertragic notch 
and also there is a fissure here in between the antihelix this portion and the antitragus this is called antitrago helicine fissure i'll tell you once again uh, let me just um, clear this and let's say this antitrago helicine fissure is here and intertragic notch is here okay as you can see we talked about the features of this portion which is the cartilaginous portion of the pinna or the auricle and the non cartilaginous portion is this the lobule right the cartilage is present only in the in this section here the cartilage here in the lobule the cartilage is not present and it is filled with fibrous tissue blood vessels so it can easily be pierced for taking blood samples or for making uh, for piercing it uh, so we can wear the earrings etc these were the important landmarks that you uh, uh, that you observe when you have a look at the auricle or the pinna okay now moving on to the next slide here you can see the cartilage the auricular cartilage seen in the human ear and here also you can see all the features you can see uh, the antitragus you can see the tragus you can see helix antihelix concha simba conchi the triangular fossa the scaphoid fossa and there's another um, important landmark that i want to show you this is um let me please just show it to you this is the darwin's tubercle if we have a look at the uh, features of external ear in the last slide this is the darwin's tubercle okay i just missed it okay now uh, the pinna is um, as we already talked about that it is the outer expanded portion of the ear projects from the side of the head serves to collect the vibrations of the air by which sound is produced and consists of a thin plate of elastic cartilage covered by skin now this skin is tightly bound to the cartilage not allowing much room for the expansion of blood or inflammatory exudates in disease conditions so such conditions are very painful okay uh, and um, we'll talk about the muscles in the next slide okay now in this slide you can see that um, there are two surfaces of the auricle one is the lateral surface or the external surface and the other one is the medial surface or the cranial surface of the auricle right and behind uh, as you can see here this groove that you see behind the ear or between the head and the cranial surface of the auricle is called the retroauricular groove this retroauricular groove is of clinical significance because it gets filled up in some disease conditions of the air when there is swell swelling or inflammatory conditions of the air this retroauricular groove gets filled up and we uh, we no more see this groove behind the air i'll show you in the in some next slide okay here um have a look at this in this slide you see the retroauricular groove 
is lost. I didn't point right onto the retroauricular groove, so you can see what I'm trying to show you. It's uh, it's 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 swollen and it's an inflammatory. It's actually a case of mastoiditis, in which the mastoid process or the mastoid air cells becomes filled up with inflammatory exudate, so it becomes swollen up and the retroauricular groove is uh, no more seen. Okay. Okay, now uh, there's another thing that I want to tell you here uh, related to the clinical aspects is that um, here in this slide, you can see that there's this uh, space, there's a black line that you see here. This is called the end oral surgical approach. In case of surgeries of the middle ear cavity or in other uh, such related conditions, the surgeons use this space to give an incision because there is a space between the cartilages. The, uh, this, this is helix, right? And this is tragus. So in between these two cartilages, there is this space where the surgeon can give uh, safely give an incision to drain the middle ear cavity or in other such conditions. And this approach is called the end oral approach. Okay, now the next thing that one, uh, I want to uh, tell you about is the muscles of the auricle. Now there are three muscles, auricularis anterior, auricularis superior and auricularis posterior. Okay, as you can see uh, in this diagram, these are the three muscles, anterior, superior and posterior auricularis. Now in humans, uh, these muscles are rudimentary or vestigial, while in lower animals, while in lower animals, these help to move the auricle uh, whenever they hear some sound and they want to direct the sound uh, into their ear, they, they just move these muscles to move their auricle. While in human beings, these muscles are rudimentary, okay? Okay, there's one important thing that I missed was that the position of the pinna, the attachment of the pinna to the side of the skull. Now, um, there's this important thing that I want to tell you is that the pinna is attached to the side of the skull uh, rather nearer the posterior aspect than the anterior, right? So when we want to examine pinna in a patient, it is better to ask the patient to turn his head away from us so we can have a look at the pinna from the back, both the pinny from the back, right? In, the, uh, in some previous slide, uh, I'll show you here. This is the way how we examine the pinna from the back because the pinna is attached more posteriorly on the side of the skull as compared to anterior. Right? So whenever we want to examine the pinna or the position of the pinna or the auricle uh, or the retroauricular groove, we examine the uh, head or the pinna from the back. Right? Okay. Now, we've done this. Okay. Now coming towards the blood supply of the auricle. The external carotid artery supplies the posterior auricular artery. The superficial temporal artery supplies the anterior auricular branch. The occipital artery, venous drainage is through the vessels following the arteries. Have a look at this diagram. You can very clearly see that the superficial temporal artery and the posterior auricular artery, which are both branches from the external carotid artery, supply the auricle. Okay. Now, talking about the innervation of the auricle, um, this is different on the lateral surface and on the medial surface of the auricle, right? Uh, on the lateral surface, we can see that the upper two-third of the auricle is innervated by the auriculotemporal nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular nerve, and the mandibular nerve is a branch of the trigeminal nerve. 
the lower one third of the lateral surface of auricle is innervated by the great auricular nerve C2 C3 talking about the medial surface of the auricle or the cranial surface of the auricle the upper um, uh, the this surface the upper one third is innervated by the lesser occipital nerve c2 and c3 while the lower two third is innervated by the great auricular nerve that is c2 and c3 thus the nerve supply of the pinna is derived from the fifth cranial nerve and the cervical spinal nerves two and three the um, lymphatic drainage talking about the lymphatic drainage of the pinna it is towards the parotid the upper deep cervical and the retro auricular groups of nodes okay now the next thing that uh, we want to study is the external acoustic meters the second part of the external ear i told you that the external ear is composed of the auricle or the pinna the second part is the external auditory meatus or the external auditory canal or the external acoustic meatus and the third part is the tympanic membrane okay so the second part is the external auditory meatus the external acoustic meatus extends from the deepest part of the concave to the tympanic membrane which is a distance of approximately 2.5 cm um and um, it is uh, it lies within the tympanic part of the temporal bone from the auricle to the tympanic membrane and as i told you it's a distance of about 2 to 3 cm in the adults okay now uh, it has two parts it has a lateral third part and medial two third part the lateral third of this slightly s shaped canal is cartilaginous and it's lined with skin that is con continuous with the auricular skin and the medial two thirds is bony and lined with thin skin that is continuous with the external layer of the lateral surface of tympanic membrane okay now the skin of the canal um the bone the skin of the cartilaginous part and the bony part it's different from each other okay the um, bony part is formed by the tympanic plate of the temporal bone which is c shaped in cross section and the posterior superior part is deficient which is formed by part of the squamous part of temporal bone the cartilaginous part if uh, also c shaped and the gap in c is filled by fibrous tissue the skin of the canal contains hair sebaceous glands ruminous glands which secrete a brown wax like substance called cerumen or ear wax it's the ear self cleaning mechanism which moves the old skin cells and cerumen to the outer parts of the ear just anterior to the external uh, auditory canal is the tmj or the temporomandibular joint the head of the mandible can be felt by placing a fingertip in the external auditory canal while the patient opens and closes the mouth here in this slide um i just want to repeat one thing that this canal is slightly curved but it could be straightened for the inspection of the tympanic membrane for that the examiner pulls the auricle backwards and upwards okay and the skin of the cartilaginous part has the ceruminous and the sebaceous glands the ceruminous is the ear wax um okay in the middle of this canal uh, there is a narrow part called the isthmus okay which is um, uh, the uh, uh, vertical diameter of which is more then the transverse diameter and this is the point where the foreign bodies of the external auditory meatus gets uh, lodged up here in this diagram uh, you can see the isthmus of the external auditory meatus okay talking about uh, the direction of the uh, external auditory meatus uh, for that 
um, the cartilaginous part is um, directed. Now there are two things. The cartilaginous part has a direction different from that of the bony part of the canal. The cartilaginous part is directed upwards, backwards and inwards. Whereas the bony is directed downwards, forwards and inwards. Thus there is an angle between the two parts. And when we do the otoscopy, this tortuosity has to be undone to get a good view of the tympanic membrane by holding the pinna from its posterior superior margin and pulling it upwards and backwards and outwards in the adults. Because in children, uh, this is different. In the adults, we do this to examine it. Okay. In this diagram, you can see that the clinician has to pull the auricle upwards, backwards and laterally to view the canal with an otoscope. Okay, here you can see the skin. The skin of the cartilaginous part of the external auditory meatus has ceruminous and sebaceous glands which produces cerumen or the wax. Sensory innervation of the external acoustic meatus is from several of the cranial nerves. The major sensory input travels through branches of the auriculotemporal nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular nerve coming from the trigeminal nerve, right? Then uh, there's auricular branch of the vagus nerve, and there are minor sensory inputs coming from the facial nerve. So uh, this is the trigeminal nerve, the vagus nerve, and the facial nerve, which are innervating this area. You need to remember the names of these three nerves when we talk about the external acoustic meters or the external auditory canal. Okay, the next thing is supramatal triangle of Maeswin. When we did the normals of the skull, then um, we read about this, the supramatal triangle of Maeswin. This is also important when we talk about the air. We knew uh, that the boundaries of the supramatal triangle of Maeswin is formed by the um, posterior superior margin of the external auditory meatus here, right? Then the second is formed by the this supraorbital, uh, I'm sorry, uh, not supraorbital, it's supra uh, mastoid crest. The second boundary is formed by this, right? And then we draw a tangent from it here. This makes up the Maeswin's triangle or the supramatal triangle. Okay, the next thing that we want to study is the tympanic membrane. This is very important and uh, you need to learn um, how to draw this tympanic membrane and there are the important landmarks that you need to know uh, about the tympanic membrane. Okay, so the talking about the tympanic membrane, it is approximately one centimeter in diameter. It is a thin oval semi-transparent membrane at the medial end of the external acoustic meatus which forms a partition between the meatus of the external ear and the tympanic cavity of the middle ear right it is a um, uh, the tympanic membrane is covered with thin skin externally and mucous membrane of the middle ear internally okay Okay, now here in this diagram, you can see the tympanic membrane or the eardrum which forms the medial most boundary of the external auditory meatus and it also forms the lateral boundary of the tympanic cavity or the middle ear cavity. So it forms a partition between the external ear and the middle ear. For introduction, it's a thin, oval, fibrous, pearly grey membrane placed at the medial end of the external auditory canal and forms a membranous partition between the external and the middle ear. It, um, okay, now let's talk about the direction, how it is placed. It is directed obliquely downwards, forwards and laterally 
and forms an angle of about 55 degrees with the floor of the meatus. Okay. Um, I just want to show you this. This diagram. Now let's read a few points about it. Then I'll show you the important landmarks on it. The nephanic membrane is an oval structure which is thickened in its circumference and is placed in a bony tympanic sulcus called sulcus tympanicus which is deficient superiorly called the notch of rivenous. Now let me show you this. Here in this diagram you can see this is the sulcus tympanicus and here where it is deficient it is called the notch of rivenous. Okay. Uh, now from the notch of rivenous from the sides of this notch emerges an anterior and a posterior fold the anterior malleolar and the posterior malleolar folds here in this diagram you can see this is the okay excuse me this is the anterior malleolar fold this is the posterior malleolar fold okay so this divides the tympanic membrane into a lower part and an upper part now this lower part is called pars tensa while this upper part is called pars flaccida now there's a reason why these are called pars flaccida and pars tensa and we're going to talk about it um, when we scroll through the next two three four slides okay um, we all already talked about the direction of the tympanic membrane how it is directed in our uh, sulcus tympanicus the concavity of the membrane faces laterally okay and anteriorly inferiorly laterally so as to act like a radar or a satellite receiving sound signals from the ground okay so they are directed antero inferiorly and laterally okay now here we can see uh, the important landmarks on otoscopic view otoscopic what is otoscopy it's viewing the air cavity through an instrument called otoscope i'll show it to you in the next slides now talking about the important landmarks of the tympanic membrane this is the lateral surface of the tympanic membrane okay now this is the uh, this uh, picture that you see it is the lateral view of the tympanic cavity from this side we see that it's concave because concavity is directed laterally the point of maximum concavity this is called umbo u m b o umbo okay and this is this that you see here through the tympanic cavity i'm sorry tympanic membrane is the handle of the malleus we'll talk about the malleus and its handle and other parts later on but right now you just need to know that this is the handle of the malleus okay here is the notch of rivenous this is the posterior malleolar fold this is the anterior malleolar fold this is pars flaccida this is pars tensa okay okay um, now uh, the color of the upper one fifth or pars flaccida is pink because the blood supply of the middle ear cavity shines through this part it is flaccid due to the absence of fibrous layer or radial and circular fibers it is therefore called pars flaccida or sharpnell's membrane the other name for pars flaccida or the upper part of the tympanic membrane is sharpnell's membrane the color of pars tensa is pearly gray normally if the color changes that means there is a pathology so talking about the layers of the uh, tympanic uh, membrane there are three layers the outer epithelial layer which is stratified squamous uh, which is continuous with the external auditory meatus the middle layer 
is fibrous. This middle layer, this fibrous layer has circular fibers and radial fibers. Okay. And the inner layer, which is the mucus layer, which is low columnar layer, the inner layer, inner layer faces the middle layer cavity. Okay. So in the pars flaccida, what happens is that the middle layer or the fibrous layer is absent. That is why the color is different from pars tensa. While in pars uh, tensa, the three layers are present. And we can also see a, a cone of light antero inferiorly. We divide the tympanic membrane into four quadrants. And we say that in the antero inferior quadrant, we see a cone of light. This cone of light is nothing but a reflection of the light which is thrown from the otoscope when we examine it uh, through an otoscope. Okay, it's um, there's nothing new in this uh, slide except that this membrane is one millimeter thick. Now here in this diagram, you can see uh, that the that here we're talking about the three layers of the tympanic membrane, the outer epithelial layer, which is derived from the skin of the meatus, the middle fibrous layer, the special fibrous tissue, which is present only in the lower four fifth part of the membrane and once destroyed is not replaced by the original fibrous tissue. Pars flaccida has only two layers, not the middle fibrous layer. Pars tensa has all the three layers. Now the angle of the tympanic membrane with the floor makes an angle of 55 degrees. Okay, now let's talk about the nerve supply of the tympanic membrane. It is extremely sensitive to pain. The lateral surface of the tympanic membrane is innervated by the auriculotemporal nerve and a branch of vagus nerve, while the medial surface is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve and a twig comes from the pharyngeal plexus. The blood supply of the lateral surface is from the deep auricular branch of the maxillary artery, while the blood supply of the medial surface of the tympanic membrane comes from the internal tympanic branch of the maxillary artery and the posterior tympanic branch of the posterior auricular artery. Okay, now let's talk about some clinical aspects. Uh, this is how we examine the air. Um, otology, otalgia, otoria. I hope you can understand the meanings of these terms. Otology is the branch of medicine in which we study about um, different conditions related to the air. Otalgia is the term used when there is pain in the air. Otoria is used when there's a discharge from the air. Okay. Um, the next things um, uh, we'll talk about in the next slides with pictures. Um, congenital metal stenosis and atresia. I just want you uh, to know that they, there's congenital metal stenosis or atresia, which is the embryological condition involving the external air. Now here you can see the auricular hematoma. You can see that there are different pictures of the hematoma which are showing different uh, extents of the making up of uh, hematoma in the external air due to bleeding within the auricle which results from trauma and it may produce an auricular hematoma which is a, a localized collection of blood that forms between the perichondrium and the auricular cartilage. And it also causes distortion of the contours of the auricle, as you can see in these pictures. As the hematoma enlarges, it compromises the blood supply to the cartilage. It has to be drained or aspirated. Otherwise, if left untreated, fibrosis develop here and um, in the overlying skin, which forms a deformed auricle, which is also called a cauliflower or boxer's air. 
here you can see the cauliflower or boxes air in which the hematoma of the external um, uh, air were not drained or treated and there was fibrosis resulting in cauliflower or boxes air the next uh, is automycosis which is the fungal infection of the external auditory canal skin it is common in hot humid climates and often secondary to prolonged use of topical antibiotics this is perichondritis or uh, inflammatory condition of the cartilage of the auricle otitis externa or acute otitis externa is uh, common disease of the air which is very painful and uh, in this um, the, uh, there is uh, inflammation of the skin lining the external auditory canal because external auditory canal is a blind culled sac it's a closed sac lined with skin it is dark and very well suited to collect moisture and prolonged exposure to moisture will disrupt the integrity of the epithelial cells and raise the ph above 5 to 7 range more prone to bacterial and fungal infections in this diagram you can see that uh, the infection of the external auditory canal due to excessive moisture in the air this is called swimmer's air okay this is end oral approach you uh, i hope you remember that in the beginning of this class i told you that there's a place where in between the uh, uh helix the crust of the helix and the tragus the, these are the cartilages na so in between these two cartilages there's a place where the cartilage is absent and the surgeon can use this approach for surgeries or to for giving skin incisions okay air irrigation air irrigation is the washing of the external auditory canal with a stream of liquid and the purpose of this is to remove the air wax to remove foreign bodies to cleans the air in case of purulent discharges caused in the middle infection in the middle ear infection for antiseptic effect to apply heat to evaluate vestibular functions for example by thermal caloric test you don't need to know a lot about this you just need to know that uh, the ENT surgeons or the ENT doctors they irrigate the air for washing purposes okay vasovagal reflex this is very important the nerve supply of the meatus is from auriculotemporal facial and vagus nerves which sometimes results in spasmodic cough and rarely in vagal reflex leading to cardiac arrest in attempts at cleaning the air syringing or removal of foreign bodies a vagal episode or vasovagal response or vasovagal attack also called neurocardiogenic syncope okay this is vasovagal reflex now this is an otoscope which is used to examine the air foreign bodies foreign body airs conditions where something is present in the air that is not normally there it is common in children especially toddlers although they can be found in adults symptoms are that patients with foreign bodies in the air are asymptomatic children uh, in children the foreign body is often an incident finding it can be insects um, outer air canal the, the they can be wax uh, which gets collected here and causes partial deafness and that has to be removed which blocks the air partially or completely that blocks the external auditory meatus the collection of uh, impacted wax if it gets collected there inspecting the tympanic membrane normally it's shiny translucent flat slightly pulled in at the center foreign bodies which cause the perforation of the tympanic membrane like this and uh, in inflammatory conditions um in the left picture you can see the normal tympanic membrane which is translucent and if the tympanic membrane becomes scarred like in the right picture and loss of translucency at uh, areas of the scar we uh, we know that there's an inflammatory process going on 
uh, now what is meringoplasty and tympanoplasty meringoplasty is an operation performed to repair the tympanic membrane while tympanoplasty is an operation performed to repair the tympanic cavity or the ossicles or parts related to the middle ear cavity so meringoplasty is done for the tympanic membrane tympanoplasty is done for the tympanic cavity this is meringotomy in order to drain any inflammatory or separative conditions of the middle ear cavity we have uh, to give uh, incision in the postero inferior quadrant of the tympanic membrane to drain pus in the middle ear cavity because this passage of cauda tympani nerve from posterior to anterior behind the tympanic membrane in order to save that nerve we give the incision in the postero inferior quadrant of the tympanic membrane thank you very much and inshallah inshallah we going to study about the rest of the air in the next class thank you